Thank you for watching my talk, Is There a Software Engineering Ethics? Now when I approached this question, the emphasis was very much on the A. Is there a software engineering ethics? Is this an idea that applies across the entire field of software engineering? Or is the idea of ethics in the production of software more pragmatic and domain driven? But what I discovered was that the question, is there a software engineering ethics at all? is one that is uh, worth asking. So I'm going to explore both in this presentation. I compared the statements that employers make publicly about the codes of practice that they expect their employees to follow from two very different domains. Uh, the domain of publicly traded uh, technology, you know, software heavy companies in the United States and uh, UK universities. The reason for picking these two domains is that they are uh, very different. The software is important in both, uh, but the contexts differ along a lot of different uh, dimensions. Now this means that we should expect if the idea of software engineering ethics is um, domain specific or is pragmatic in some way, we should expect to see differences between those two systems even though we may not be able to pin down uh, with this scoping study what the um, cause uh, or what the important factors that lead to those differences are. So what I actually found was that neither of these domains are talking publicly about the uh, ethics or professionalism of uh, their software production or of their software engineers at all. And this will motivate uh, some further questions which I think are really interesting and you know, warrant further study uh, where or indeed at all uh, if they do at all where do software engineers in these organizations get their uh, ethical ideas and how do they resolve ethical issues that are raised um, and we still have this question of whether uh, codes of practice or at least um, tacit ethical expectations in these domains are distinct and whether there is a domain independent idea of software engineering ethics. But we also have the question why don't employers talk about this publicly? Uh, questions of bias in AI, uh, responsibility over information security breaches or other software failures do make it into the mainstream news fairly frequently so uh, why don't these companies publicly talk about what they're doing uh, to accept responsibility or to make their employees responsible for those situations my interest in this question specifically in the domain specific nature of this question uh, is because i'm coming from an industry background i've worked in uh, these sort of silicon valley uh, tech companies I, I worked for facebook for a while and i've done some contracting for apple as well uh, and after 15 years or so of doing that i moved uh, into a research software engineering career now research software engineering is a fairly new field even though the practice uh, goes back for decades it is the idea of applying software engineering techniques to the software that is written for research, which is becoming more and more important uh, to the research produced in more fields uh, over time. Now, as I uh, embarked on this new career, I found that there was a, an expectation that uh, you know, I would take the sort of expertise and the techniques that I've developed uh, over my uh, industry career and sort of apply them to making research software better. Uh, and I wondered whether this was um, really what we should be doing, whether the, you know, whether the uh, appropriate thing to do in a research context is to look at how commercial software engineers work and uh, adopt their practices or whether we should be defining new methodologies, new practices uh, that are more relevant to the distinct context and goals of producing software for research. 
there's a an idea in the um, literature, particularly in the field of scientific computing, of a chasm. And this uh, chasm in software engineering was originally presented as a methodological gap that there was um, the things that people do in commercial software are not appropriate for what is happening in scientific computing and that these two domains need to uh, come together at a sort of theoretical or epistemological level and uh, work out what it is that scientific computing should be doing uh, in order to get better results from its software. But this idea has morphed over time into a capability gap and uh, into sort of surveying practices that we see people doing in industry, whether it's um, sort of software engineering technical practices or agile software development methodological practices and project management practices and saying, here's what people do in, you know, the, for want of a better phrase, the real world. Why aren't we doing this? Or, or at least like, here's the evidence that we aren't doing this in scientific computing uh, and then asking the question, why not? So I thought that uh, the requirements of professionalism and ethics should would probably be distinct in these two domains because the um, the nature of the business and the expected outcomes uh, are very different, uh, and so that this would be an avenue to explore whether software engineering done in a commercial context and in a research context uh, has any difference to it. And what I found is that, at least publicly, these organisations aren't talking about um, ethical software engineering at all. The codes of practice of a uh, publicly traded US technology company are mostly about ensuring that the board of directors can demonstrate that they have told their employees not to do anything illegal or contravening uh, Securities and Exchange Commission uh, regulations. So. You know, we see things like employees must follow all applicable laws at all times. Um, in fact, you know, you could argue that in the case of Google, their bring the dog to work policy is more important as a public symbol of their professionalism than anything to do with the way that their software engineers write software because they explicitly mention it and don't mention anything about software engineering. But the, the broad trend is that these companies are talking about uh, not engaging in anti-competitive behaviour, not engaging in uh, bribing government officers, not engaging in insider trading, the kinds of things that would get the board of directors into trouble. And meanwhile, the uh, academic institutions in the UK are by and large um, deriving their ideas of uh, ethical practice in research from a single document uh, which was produced by a um, sort of management consultative committee of the uh, universities in the United Kingdom, a document called the Concord Act to Support Research Integrity. And this document doesn't talk about uh, software uh, particularly, and so none of the universities do. They talk about, um, again, compliance with uh, legal requirements. Uh, they talk about um, standards appropriate to like, the professions that the research engages with um, but that's very different it's very different from saying that people who are researching software engineering should comply with professional guidelines for software engineering uh, and saying people who are doing software engineering for research should comply with professional guidelines from software engineering and both of those are very different from saying here is what our guidelines for professional software engineering are so the, these um, codes of practice talk about uh, honesty and integrity in research, uh, making the uh, like methods and uh, data available for uh, you know, critique of the academic record, but don't talk about the specific role of software uh, or uh, the specific requirements on the creation of software in supporting those goals despite the uh, growing importance of software in the, in the research context. So the conclusion is 
uh, the, you know, I still don't know whether the uh, ethical requirements are different in these two different uh, fields because the employers are not actually talking, at least publicly, about ethical software engineering. Now that doesn't mean that it isn't happening at all, although that is certainly one uh, possibility. It, it could be that software engineering is not uh, a discipline in which the uh, social impact or the ethical requirements of the job and the professionalism are broadly accepted and, uh, and that the need for discussion is seen by the people engaging in it. It could be that, uh, that actually this is the case, that people are talking about ethics, but they're doing it within their companies. And maybe there are internal policy documents on intranets uh, somewhere that we just don't have access to publicly. Um, or maybe there are sort of consultation groups or even hallway discussions uh, on ha how to resolve these issues when they're raised on a case-by-case -case basis. I would argue that it probably isn't coming from um, professional codes such as the uh, ACM Code of Ethics because the ACM and similar organisations don't represent enough of the body of software engineers globally to influence the practice of software engineering globally. Uh, ACM claimed that they have approximately 2 million members worldwide and uh, that is going to be a tiny fraction of the total number of people engaged in software engineering worldwide. But I still believe that these domains are different in a lot of different ways. Um, so you know, the goal of this work is different. So you're either producing some software that you are going to sell or uh, sell a service based on or sell a hardware project the hardware product that encapsulates the software uh, in the commercial context and in an academic context the software is an instrument through which you advance your research goals. The ways in which the creation of the software uh, is funded and people are uh, put onto the projects and paid is very different. The amount that you spend uh, both in terms of staff time and in terms of money on maintenance and support of your software is very different and the ethical challenges are different. In fact you could say that software um, has some distinct ethical uh, potential benefits in research. For example replacing uh, animal testing, uh, in vivo testing within silico modeling of um, biological systems represents a great opportunity for uh, software to be used as a social good, um, <clears throat> which is a clearer benefit than, uh, say, discussions of uh, artificial intelligence algorithms being used by social media giants, which are generally more likely to be seen as uh, potentially negatively impacting society. <clears throat> so I, I think there's a, a lot of interesting future work that can be done in this area. I would uh, love to hear um, your thoughts on this program of work and indeed whether there is existing literature that I've missed that covers this. I wasn't able to find, for example, any field work on the question of how do software engineers in the workplace tackle ethical uh, problems and I think that that's an important thing to look at just to understand how are people currently solving these problems or even are they currently solving these problems um, uh, do the problems get raised within the workplace? How do they get discussed? What information is used uh, to uh, come to any conclusions? What form of decision-making process is used? This would be really interesting to understand what the uh, ethical dimension of software engineering like, really looks like when uh, software engineering is practiced. But it's also, I think, useful to take this scoping work that I've done uh, on looking at uh, codes of practice from employers of software engineers and to uh, expand that out to a wider sample to form a sort of catalogue of uh, software engineering ethics in the workplace so that we can um, answer empirical questions like are employers in particular contexts, uh, you know, whether that's geographic contexts or um, sort of lines of business or even 
modes of organization, say corporations versus uh, not-for-profit charities, more public in their position on software engineering ethics? And does the extent to which these organizations engage with questions of uh, ethics and professionalism correlate with any different outcomes in the uh, software that they produce? Um, as I say, I'd be really interested to uh, talk about uh, these questions in the discussion. So uh, thank you very much for watching my presentation. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, coming to this talk and um, you know, thanks to the organizers for putting this on and for, uh, for accepting my talk, which is on the topic of, is there a software engineering ethics? And I originally posted, posed this question in terms of, is there a software engineering ethics? Is there a sort of a, a, an idea that's generally accepted by um, the people involved in the construction of software about what um, the ethical practice would look like? Uh, it became clear during the work I was doing that the question, is there a software engineering ethics you know, at all, is uh, one that is relevant to ask in certain contexts. And so uh, that is really kind of the direction that um, that this work has uh, taken. So uh, to introduce the work, um, I am a PhD student at Oxford University, so the very beginning of my uh, PhD. And to start with some sort of scoping work, I looked at the publicly available codes of practice from two different groups of organizations. So from uh, publicly traded technology companies in the US, uh, so the, you know, the likes of um, Amazon, Microsoft, Alphabet, which is uh, the owners of Google, and then UK universities. Now, obviously, these are very different um, domains, so I don't expect to be able to say any sort of you know, causal, like here's the difference between those and you know, here's how we see that play out in their ideas of ethics. But they are you know, definitely distinct. And so should there be differences, we would expect them to, uh, to, to be visible in those two uh, different groups. They're also both highly software dependent domains. I mean, this is obvious in the case of someone like Microsoft, you know, the clue is in the name, they are a software company. Um, their sort of purpose is selling software or selling services that are based on software. But more and more, um, research is becoming uh, highly dependent on software. The um, In the sciences, there's uh, sort of surveys that suggest that around 90% of researchers depend on writing software for they enabling their own research and also enable the research of others through the, the construction of software. Um, so you know, both US technology companies and UK universities uh, rely on software. Um, I, I should say not just the scientific researchers, but you know, the digital humanities, digital social sciences. Uh, it's across all domains of research that uh, software engineering is important. And so you know, the, what I wanted to ask was, does the way in which these organizations think about uh, ethical practice m modify the way they think about software construction? On the one hand, you know, producing um, software as a commercial product, and on, on the other hand, producing research, because research does have its own sort of um, system of values around uh, ethical integrity, uh, or ethical practice, rather. What I've f found instead was that nobody was talking about um, the ethics, at least in terms of their, their public like, statements about what they expect of their employees. N none of them are talking about ethical construction of software or the application of their ethics to software construction. So you know, we, we could see um, the idea of a code of practice as being very sort of you know, rules-based, like um, being a sort of deontological system of ethics and saying this is what good or bad behavior looks like, is when you do these actions or when you don't do these actions. Um, so saying that these organizations 
aren't engaging with ethics in that way doesn't necessarily say that the individuals involved or that or organizations involved aren't considering uh, ethics of software engineering at all it just means that if they are they're getting their ideas from uh, different places um, it it could mean that the conversation the public conversation around the ways in which these organizations is run doesn't extend to uh, ideas of ethical behavior um, and so you know that is an interesting question to ask is like, why aren't why isn't this being discussed um, and it still leaves me with the question i went in to find out the answer to which is are these practices or these codes or expectations uh, different in different domains so the reason that I'm doing this is that um, I have been in the um, sort of the industry as a software engineer for around 15 years. So I've worked at um, <clears throat> Silicon Valley companies as, you know, such as Facebook and Apple, at like large UK companies like O2, which is a um, telecoms company, and Arm, uh, which is a you know, CPU manufacturer, and came into this uh, sort of nascent community called research software engineering where at universities and the you know, and academics have realized the importance that software plays in the production of their research and are asking questions about are we doing this well or rather they're they're saying we have a bunch of problems is the we have a bunch of problems in the software that we make is this because we aren't doing this well and so there's been this idea of um, a chasm between the software engineering practice in industry and in research. And it was originally presented by Diane Kelly as a, a, a problem of methodology of the supposedly domain independent ideas of how you build software, um, such as like agile software development, lean software development being applicable only to commercial institutions and not applicable to the world of research and a question for software engineers and researchers to come together and define a different uh, sort of methodology a different like epistemology if you like of what software is and why it gets built and how to build it um, but over time while the idea of the chasm has uh, stayed with us its meaning has shifted to here are a bunch of practices that we see people doing in uh, in industry. Here are here is a survey of what people are doing in research, and they're not adopting all of these practices. So yeah, it's become this idea of the reason that you're not um, getting success out of your software engineering is that you aren't software engineering hard enough. And so uh, you know, I want to sort of explore where the um, the geology, if you like, that sort of leads to this chasm and expect that if you know, if what they're saying is there is a gap between these two different domains let's look at the differences in these uh, between these domains and the way they think about the ethics of uh, the work that they're doing could be a likely source to, um, to discover th this difference and this gap what we mostly see in the corporate world and the link at the bottom of this slide is to the um, the data I used for uh, constructing this study. Um, is you you could define a corporate code of conduct as being let the directors state to their customers and to their investors that they have told their employees not to break corporate law or to get the company into regulatory trouble. Um, very literally in the case of this quote from Amazon, employees must follow applicable laws, rules and regulations at all times. Um, th that kind of thing, the uh, avoiding insider trading, avoiding bribery of government officials, avoiding uh, like um, conflicts of interest, uh, avoiding abusing commercial um, or monopoly power uh, for commercial gains are found quite a lot. You know, in, it, we could say that uh, Google have more weight attached to their bring your dog to work policy than they do to the production of their software because they mention their bring your dog to work policy in their corporate code of conduct. They tell the public that 
employees are allowed to bring their dogs to work. They don't tell the public that they are considering you know, a, a wider group of stakeholders in the construction of their software. It's not to say that this is like universally how um, these codes of conduct work. The Microsoft's one does mention wider ideas like accessibility, like uh, respect for the customer. But, um, but broadly speaking, the agreement between all of these is their employees won't break corporate law. The universities pretty much don't mention software at all. In fact, in the UK, there is a sort of single guiding uh, framework, a document called the Concord Act to Support Research Integrity, um, which was produced by the, uh, the sort of um, like discussion group of all of the managers uh, of the universities across the UK. And that talks about the um, honesty and veracity and integrity of the scientific record of being uh, open and collegiate in discussions of uh, you know treating uh, human participants in research with um with respect and doesn't talk about software and so therefore we don't see any of this um reference to software in the uh, codes of practice that are published by the universities themselves um despite the like significant amount of uh, work that goes into building software and also the fact that the software that they're creating is sort of instrumental to this research. So they're not saying like, do the, do the uh, take the integrity of your research into account when you are designing these things that support the research. They're kind of saying researchers should do this in the process of the research and this like uh, instrumental phase of the work is going uh, unmentioned. So across these places, um, the employers aren't talking about ethical software. That do, like I say, that doesn't mean that the, the people involved or indeed the systems and organizations involved aren't taking the problem seriously. It just means they're not doing it uh, publicly. Now, uh, a previous speaker mentioned the ACM Code of Ethics. Um, if we look at like, the ACM, they claim that uh, about 2 million people are members of their organization. Uh, in the US alone, there are well over 20 million people employed in, the, in computing in general. So the, but the ACM's membership is worldwide. So a very small fraction of um computing professionals and software engineers are signed up to the acm's code of ethics so that may not be what is happening we might not be seeing people saying oh, that our professional code tells us what to do so we don't need our uh, a corporate code once again they could have uh, very different ideas of where ethics come from it could be from um, internal discussions from um, in like policies or from uh, ad hoc uh, sort of event-driven or exception-driven uh, approaches. But I still believe that these fields are different. You are doing different things. In one case, you are um, set, making a product that you want to sell to customers or uh, that will enable a service that you sell to customers. In another one, you're advancing um, knowledge and research, the way that you uh, staff and fund these, which then means that the way that uh, the way that you staff and fund them is different, which then means that the way that you uh, invest in the ongoing existence and maintenance of the, the things that you produce uh, is very different. And indeed, the um, the ethical problems that are encountered are likely to be different. Um, the in industry companies I was looking at, the likes of uh, Microsoft or Google or Apple or Netflix aren't going to have concerns about reducing uh, animal testing in their work, one would expect, um, which you would expect to see in academia. On the other hand, most academics don't get the chance to deploy a biased AI to 2 billion people worldwide, which is a problem that, uh, that these large companies in the US uh, do have to deal with. So what I'm 
uh, proposing to do going forwards, which I'd really uh, be interested to hear from uh, everybody in the discussion after this talk uh, about is uh, one building up this sort of catalog of um, ethical issues in the uh, or codes of ethics to understand more about this landscape and the other is to sort of uh, to bring in like a mixed methods view and to do the field work and to ask people uh, the people who are making software how they do address and consider these issues um and to uh, you know, to kind of close this gap between it is not being talked about publicly and uh finding out where indeed these ethical uh discussions are taking place and how these questions are being resolved um so that is uh that is my talk thank you very much for listening thank you graham for the insightful talk uh, certainly, I can agree that uh, we don't hear about ethical aspects talked about publicly as much as uh, one would expect. So um, we, while we wait for the questions, just a reflection, um, as you mentioned, that we don't uh, hear so much, so many people talking about ethical aspects publicly. Could it be because it's so much to do with uh, self reflection or self-evaluation say that uh, employees sign the code of conduct, conduct but it is up to them to evaluate whether they follow or not there is no sort of uh, way to ensure that there is some sort of you know it's not black and white it's not uh, like legal aspects or law so could it be that uh, could that be the reason why people don't talk publicly about this so that that's an interesting um perspective and i think that i i think you're right there is something in that um and i, I uh, was talking about this at a uh, an internal symposium and uh, one of the organizers of that kept coming back to this question of like what the rules are you know where, what rules should software engineers be following what where are the, the the rules that i can follow to decide whether my work is ethical or unethical um and of course like that is um you know situational it is uh like hard if not impossible to uh, create up front um and so that means that you can't very easily say right you are allowed to do these things you aren't allowed to do these things there's a certain amount of we'll know it when we see it um and that may be putting people off from sort of saying publicly hey, here's where we draw our line in the sand because they don't want to then find out that everybody else wishes they'd drawn the lines somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, these questions, particularly in relation to um, the growing application of AI, but uh, the you know, other examples we've had before, medical instrumentation, um, information security, and so on, these questions do keep coming up in the news and like, you know, breaking through that barrier into public perception but not yet in such a way that people feel the need to like discuss their solutions publicly. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And um, another aspect, I mean, you are comparing the academics with uh, practice, software engineering practice, but how I see is that software engineering research is highly applied, but I will hold my question because there is a question by a keynote speaker so the discussion on ethics and software goes back at least to the first draft of the first draft of the Code of Ethics in 1999. Do you think the issues or ways to deal with them have changed since then? If so, how? I think that the uh, so the sort of ACM IEEE code is quite um, broad and you know and as a result quite um, like non-prescriptive. You know, it says. Uh, you should take the needs of the public into account. You should communicate uh, those needs. You should uh, you know, blow the whistle if uh, there's no other route to resolution. Um, it isn't a particularly uh, sort of specific document. And as a result, I think it has both the benefit that it's like more or less universally applicable, but also the deficit that it's a bit like reading tea leaves and you can, you know, you can kind of... Um, project what you want to get out of the document onto your reading uh, of it to some extent. Please go ahead, Alicia. I think we have 
few more seconds. I think there is one more person who wants to ask the question, but we might actually run out of time before we get to the question. Okay, sure. Well, please I'll be feel in the free to join afterwards. the discussion room, uh, and if you have any questions, also try to use the chat options. You can directly. We have to admit me. Oh, okay. Oh, I think we, you will have to take it offline. Uh, but we, you are reading the chats, I guess, also yeah. Graham, uh, at the same time. And then please use the chat option. Also, maybe you could connect to them, or um, I would ask also you to connect to the author. So that